Okay. So about six years ago, I made a, my very first video on YouTube was on the topic of, please ignore the boxes here, uh, on the topic of basic research. This is my first video. I looked very anxious. I was anxious because uh, without one of the details, but I put my first video out there because this has been and is a topic of immense uh, importance to me. I am a I feel like I'm a scientist at heart, um, but I arrive at more from the perspective of like Richard Feynman would say, the joy in finding thing out. So uh, also a Richard Dawkins angle, whereby Richard, Richard, Mr. Dawkins would say, uh, if you want your child to be more uh, interested in the universe, let them play in the backyard, right? I'm doing a bad job paraphrasing this, but I've been that person, that kid. Uh, I've always been like this for as far back as I can remember, and I'm still like that. And uh, that's what makes me say that I consider myself a scientist to be, uh, I consider myself a scientist or a technologist at heart, right? And when I originally made a, a video in, uh, in uh, huge support or in support of supporting the basic uh, establishment or the foundation for basic research, this was my stance. It will always be my stance. I've always been pro science. Um, I first got introduced, this is not the book, but one of the books by Carl Sagan was titled, this is not the book again, this is just the same author. It's not showing up with the zoom filter on property. Here we go, Carl Sagan. But one of the, one of the first books I read on this topic, going back at least 18 years, uh, is called Science as a Candle in the Dark. Uh, and the main title is A Demon Haunted World. So Demon Haunted World, Science, of a Can Science as a Candle in the Dark, written by, written, written by uh, Dr. Carl Sagan, the late Dr. Carl Sagan. Uh, it's even got some predictions in that book, which are uh, scary. And uh, I feel that there's a lot of opportunity to do course correction. Um, and that's uh, as is a serious topic, but that's as simply as I can say that. Uh, before I talk about the course correction and what exactly I'm talking about, let's take a step back and uh, and and then and, and, uh, just start with the basics. So, in terms of the basics, this is the definition of science, whereby science is knowledge about or study of the natural world based on facts learned through experiments and observation. I pretty much read from the from the uh, screen from Marion's Webster's. Um, in terms of how I interpret science or the scientific method, the best the best definition, the simplest definition that I've come across is through Dr. Marvin Minsky, the late Dr. Marvin Minsky, and Dr. Minsky would say. And I'm not huge on Dr. Minsky, not that I do not want to. It's just that I've only had a chance to watch like five or six hours of, maybe three or four hours of content through Dr. Minsky. Very interesting guy, very interesting guy. And I just very, I think he, he has the right intuitive from my very limited three to four hour vantage point. He's got the right intuition about, uh, a lot of different things, particularly AI, because that was his baby. And he, he literally, uh, you know, he was thinking about like pediatric uh, psychology. Uh, so he was thinking the right things uh, from my very limited and uh, uneducated vantage point. But anyways, the Dr. Minsky's uh, definition of science is so, so simple. And Dr. Minsky would say, in the Society of Mind lectures that if you have an hypothesis, you conduct an experiment in order to be able to validate or refute that hypothesis. That's the best and the simplest example 
uh, or definition of science that I've come across. When I Google a uh, image search for the scientific method, then you come across something similar, uh, only that it's uh, split in a couple of more steps. And as you see in this uh, example, these are all images that are Creative Commons, by the way. Uh, the following example directly from Wikipedia highlights that you first make an observation where you have a question, you do some preliminary research related to that topic or area. You then form a hypothesis, and then you construct a experiment to either prove that hypothesis true or to the contrary, right? Then you analyze the data that you've collected, you form or report on your conclusion, and you repeat the loop again. It's pretty much what I shared through Dr. Minsky, uh, just like I said, a couple more steps. Uh, so, so this is like, this is, this is the, uh, the I'm not going to talk about this right now. This is the scientific method. Now, uh, when it comes to the scientific method or science in general, or research in general, in this case, because we were started talking about research, uh, I, I believe research is of two types. You have basic research, which is the topic of conversation, again, today after six years, it's not that every six years, I'm going to put a video about this. I really believe this, this, is, this is like one pillar. If you sustain it, then you can have a civilization for 100 years. Depends how things evolve, right? I don't know how things are going to evolve even in the next eight, eight years. But uh, let me, let, so the, the, this, this is, so if there was one of the pillars for the, the, the foundation, then this would be the core pillar, you know, ethics, uh, the culture itself, and the scientific, all of these are super, super important. Uh, you cannot have growth in one area without the nuances and like, you know, the things done with love in other areas. But I, I truly feel from a very uneducated perspective, I'm not a scientist. I never even went to university, right? I just took some college level courses, but I feel this is one of the areas that either sets a course, a path, a chart for civilization for, for as long as you keep making invest in, investments in this area, basic research, then you, like going back to a system, you know, your system keeps working based on the inputs. And if you ignore this area, that increases the probability that the civilization could get disrupted. And I'm not coming again at this from a sensationalist point of view. I just feel that what I'm saying is true. And it's not because I'm saying it. If we, uh, we see it around the world right now that uh, cultures where, the, where there's a, uh, a practice of uh, establishing the scientific research base uh, for at least a number of decades tend to do well. Um, science and prosperity has mostly been done in a Western context. So the Western civilization has done uh, obviously much better and there's all the contribution almost during the past well, since the German Empire, the British Empire, and now the American Empire. So it's mostly a lot of the, I, I would think a lot of the scientists have come from re, the, these three regions, but that, that obviously that's not true because there's been many contributions from other parts of the world. So it depends how far back you want to go. But for like for on a 300 to 400 year time frame, 300 year, year time frame, I would say that's true with some contributions from Russia uh, and other parts of the world. Uh, but in the past couple of decades, this uh, trend has changed whereby there's a lot of scientific research emerging from pretty much all the different parts of the world because thanks to the internet, uh, the same information is available to anyone anywhere. And so you can set up the scientific research facilities in order to be able to promote scientific research 
in the area of your choosing, right? Ideally, you do basic research across the board. So the, the angle, there is an angle to uh, other aspects that I've, uh, this is an old document, I haven't had a chance to update it, but there is a, there is a, there is a correlation of this and this. So you, you, you can, I would feel, have a technologically advanced uh, civilization uh, and the scientific research feeds into the technological development. So yes, you can have a technologically advanced civilization, but as one of the folks in the crypto arena uh, or somebody connected to the folks who started the whole modern crypto movement, uh, Hal Finney would say that technology can either be leveraged in order to liberate humans or to suppress humans. And I am not saying this to make anyone look bad. That is not my intention. It's just a simple thought or a observation. Not a, you know. uh, and, and it really comes down to that. You can have scientific uh, advancement and research, but the question is, are you using that technology in order to be able to bring hope and healing into the lives of people? Or are you doing it to suppress them and do mean things to them? And that is for a people and a culture to decide. But I don't see this again to make anyone look bad because like Jeffrey Mishloff would say, and I'm just very new, I just heard about this last week, maybe this week, J Jeffrey Mishloff would say, I want to extend love to all people and in all things at all times. Then there was a caveat where he said, but it does not mean that we tolerate, I mean, that we're not going to be able to do it justice paraphrasing these comments. But Mishlov also said, it doesn't mean we accept all of their behaviors. And so you can love a person while distancing the person from their behaviors. And maybe the same can be said for groups of people and civilizations, right? Because we want to see people change. I want to see myself change, right? And I want to see others change themselves as well. And I would think, not to sound all that, definitely not to sound all that, I would think this is a deeper conversation because if you genuinely loved someone, doesn't matter where they are from, then uh, there's a couple of thoughts on it. You would want them to obviously do well. But what, what I was really thinking is, you know, there's a lot of like, we're, 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 this is a sub thought, but it seems like, like Fear, fear can creep up in a culture. Um, and I feel like, you know, that it's different that I would think we could do a couple of PhDs on this as to why a culture would allow the fear to, uh, you get what you tolerate basically, right? So what, I, what I'm saying is that Excuse me, sorry about that. Excuse my manners. Yeah, we don't want to create a society of fear and shame where people are, you don't want to leverage that as a as a as a tool for behavior. Uh, because fear kills the mind. And so if you're gonna leverage uh, probably does something to the brain. Like if you're living in a uh, culture of perpetual fear, fear is exercise. I don't know what that does to your amygdala and how it's firing and what it's doing to your whole bit brain. You know, there's three parts of the brain. There's the brain stem, then there's the limbic, and then there's neocortex. But if your amygdala is somewhere in the, lodged in the middle is like constantly firing all the time, I don't know what it does to your brain overall. 
So you could again have technological advancement and progress and all uh, these cultures or uh, places, but how are you gonna use the technology? Totally off topic, totally off topic, okay? Now, come back to the topic. We spoke about today's topic, basic research. What is science? I think I went through the differences between basic research and applied research because I've done multiple takes of this video. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I did, did this one. So, so the basic basic research is not outcome driven. That's my understanding. Of it. So, if you are uh, doing a study on, as it says, how to prevent mosquito bites from itching, that's not necessarily outcome driven, right? Or if you're or if you're studying how, uh, how to, uh, studying to find what marketing strategies to use on college campuses. That doesn't also seem to be outcome driven. Whereas if you look at applied research, it's very outcome driven. Where are the examples? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I totally mixed them up. These were examples of applied research. And I was thinking, yeah, I'm not doing it right, right? So, yeah, you're, if you're studying to find what marketing strategies to use on college campus, that totally is an example of applied research. Something that would be an example of basic research is to figure out why there's the algal bloom in our Great Lakes. Like, what are the what what, what are the what, what's causing something like that in the first place? Or to go by some of these examples up here. Um, how various types of kiwis are grown in Chile, or uh, like this one, um, seeing what areas of the United States have the most rain. These are some of the examples of basic research, not necessarily outcome driven, whereas applied research tends to be more close, I seem, to the engineering side of things, like somewhat out outcome driven. Right? Uh, kind of. I could, I could be wrong. I don't think I'm doing a good job, very good job explaining to you. But basic, basically, you have basic research across the board, broad base, it could be in any discipline. Applied research can also be in any discipline. But you're not looking for certain outcomes, right? You're just, you do basic research and all be able to improve your understanding in that area. Whereas applied research is, to find practical solutions to existing problems. All right, so we're back on track. Okay, now the reason why I'm talking about scientific research again today, and I'm not gonna do this every six years, I actually, um, I wanna do like a fund, not to, like not to, I, I think a, a portion of the, government expenditure should go towards supporting uh, basic research, right? So let's let's talk about this. But before I do that, let me just get a blank sheet of, uh, I was gonna say paper. But uh, yeah, so there's, there's different ways through which um, uh, the, research can be funded. And there's like when you uh, Google different kinds of innovation, then you come across terms like G-E-R-D, B-E-R-D, and there's others, right? There are others. I have no idea how to increase the text size here. So G-E-R-D stands for um, government expenditure. What did I just do? Uh, government expenditure, I'm not gonna write the whole word, on R&D, okay? Government expenditure in R&D is G-E-R-D. So this would be in the, say if this was Canada or USA, uh, in the USA, I think it's both Congress and Senate working together, right? So Congress, let me see if you have more. Congress 
I think that's how it works. Plus send it. And what was gonna happen is they would meet. Obviously there's like steps happening here. There's a, like people working here in the wider body of the uh, institution and they prepare the documents provided to the Congress. And then the Congress approves a budget which is then released overall, right? Everybody hears about this, the budget is released, right? Now a portion of the budget, I don't know what the portion is, but a portion of the budget goes towards supporting the military intelligence, law enforcement, uh, and random order, right? Portion goes towards, so we'll just call it security here, finally. And my writing is really bad. And then there's healthcare, initiatives and this one okay. so this would in the US it would be mostly to NIH right this would be mostly DOD or else uh, other uh, female uh, others then there would be um, what we're talking about right Basic research, right? So I don't, I don't know. I don't think the the the, uh, the uh, it's it's actually uh, it has a category of its own. So some of it may be here within the healthcare budget. Some of it may be here. Um, but if you look at the actual proportion. If you could, and there are obviously other things, right? Roads have to be built. There's funding for schools, you know, funding for veterans, veterans affairs, uh, funding for what else? What's it called? Uh, aid and donations to other countries. Uh, there are many aspects of budget, budgetary. Uh, uh, when it comes to the enablement of the budget. And I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about here. But if you looked at like all of this money that is allocated, so this is in the domains of GERD, remember that, right? So GERD as a proportion, as a, as a pr proportion, proportion, I think this is called GERD as a proportion of uh, government ex gov no, it is government expense as a proportion of the GDP, right? So this is an actual indicator. I think OECD measures this and so does the World Bank. I know definitely OECD measures this, right? I think World Bank measures it too, maybe other institutions. But OECD definitely measures this. So when it comes to GERD as a proportion of the GDP, historically, up until the last couple of years, this was going like this, right? It was kind of like this in the 90s. I don't know. I, I, I could be wrong about this. But then it took a hit. And in the 2000s, it started going like this. This is the government expenditure arm. You must remember. That. Now, this was a trend for the United States. But not just United States, we were looking at this trend for UK, maybe Germany, other European countries, right? They were all kind of plateaued out and were starting to climb down. In the past couple of years, it, has, it may have received a little bit of a boost. So now the graph is looking something like this. So coming back to this area here, if you were going to synthesize the amount of out of the capital or money being allocated towards su supporting basic research, then that proportion of the government expenditure as a proportion uh, of the GDP is being shrinking and has been shrinking for quite some time, you know, with the exception, like I said, in the past couple of years. So I don't know what happened there. I haven't been following the news as much. So, and this is the trend for most of the um, 
the regions across the Western Hemisphere. Now, why did this happen? Let's clean, this clear, the, clean the screen and uh, think about this. Because if you look at the history of science in the United States, this is the 1900s, right? So this is not baseline. This is not zero. I don't know what number you would allocate to this. But most, like, but you, there's a couple of uh, reasons why the United States was going to become the next big scientific powerhouse. And one of them was effective immigration. The other one was uh, the develop, the, the enablement of a military uh, institution that could support the scientific development and the development of the world. Uh, the effective immigration included a lot of scientists, mostly at that time from Europe, and then eventually from all the parts of the world. And soon in the 20s and 30s, the scientific progress started looking like this. However you want to measure that, uh, whether you want to measure it in terms of the output for the GDP with regards to the inputs going into basic research, which I will share in a bit, or whether you're looking at the numbers of quality patents that are submitted or patents in general, right? Because you can you can have shit patents too, excuse my language. You can have really bad patents as well, right? But but the graph started looking like this. And, and by World War II, the United States was firmly established uh, as a leading power in, uh, in the scientific and technological realm. Right, and this this trend I would think continues. Right, I'm not saying the graph actually looks like this, but but since after 2000, some, something happened. Right, and the graph started going like this. Right, so we don't. I don't know right now where the graph. I don't think the graph looks like this right now. Right, I don't know what it actually looks like. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. I have no idea what it looks like. Right, so I don't know what the graph actually looks like past the year 2000. However, I would caution that if the support for basic research is ignored and the graph starts looking like this, right, then this is going to be really bad. This is really going to be really bad for North America, and it's going to be. It's not going to be good for us, all the folks living in North America. Let's let's put it that way, right. I, I realize, appreciate it's a global interconnected world, but you need to invest in your scientific research base for you to be able to power the engine of prosperity, because this is really the true engine of prosperity, right? So again, this is happening across most of the Western world, not just the United States, right? I don't know what the reasons are, Maybe it's uh, the two wars, and I'm not, like, I hope my words are not misconstrued, ask questions, don't assume. There's a lot of money went into the wars, um, right? So maybe, maybe it's something else. Uh, maybe it's because there's not enough representation for STEM or STEAM in the government, right? Uh, which is an issue that has come up in the past. I've looked at some data here. I think I have some screenshots in my Dropbox, I used to make Google Dropbox. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, an anti-immigration sentiment um, that seems to be developing, at least in the United States, uh, which may inhibit uh, the ability to be able to attract scientists and technologists, right? Um, maybe something else, maybe something else, I don't know, right? Maybe it's the rise of uh, populism um, and uh, correspondingly, uh, along with the rise of populism, there may be an attack on the uh, intellectual uh, research base, which is a, you get me? Um, whereby folks like, uh, this is a longer conversation, but uh, 
basically, uh, yeah, I've got like different schools of thought on the, because I didn't come from a traditional education system, but I don't think you can support the scientific research base without the means of being able to have folks going through you know, doing well in primary school and going, going to higher education. And you need folks to have their master's degree, some going into areas of research, getting their PhDs as a proportion of all the students, I mean. And you need folks to do this across the board in the different sciences. Uh, biology is also physics now. Maybe all these things. That's how you look at it. Definitely is physics from my perspective. It's, it's 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 not this like so i mean anyways i won't get into all the other stuff quantum mechanics and stuff like that but it's all physics right so you, you need folks to go in all these areas in order to be able to uh, push the knowledge the front the frontier right, under like uh, of what we know and uh so 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 this is what this is one uh th this is a trend uh, I, again, don't know when it comes to government expenditure on R&D, what the graph, again, looks like right now. But uh, we have a little bit of a situation at, at the moment. Uh, yeah, so if, if some, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I should even make a video about this. Because I'm so uneducated and uh, so uh, I'm not very well informed on this topic, but it is a topic that I've thought about a lot in the past. And this is, some, this is something that came into my conscious awareness again. But I don't follow the news, I don't read The Economist, and uh, I don't look at the scientific literature as much. I'm not even reading IEEE's. Um, just man, I just like really not priority. It's just I just I need to I need to make money. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard for me to find time to make the uh, read I took inspection, but but what what I'm saying is this is a very important issue, right? And going back to my diagram, if I may, let's see which one of the caps come up. You, you know, you can have scientific research and technological advancement. And this is a spectrum, right? Where you are on the freedom and liberty side of things. But uh, the, the other thing that's going on is, um, uh, let's see, let me save this. The other thing we're starting to see is the um, technological advancement. So it depends who you ask. If you ask Peter Thiel, he's like, we haven't had much of technological progress. So I don't know how you would draw the graph. I have no idea, right? Whereas if you ask somebody like Ray Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil has obviously put out a lot of books and you know, it's of the opinion that the, technological progress is exponential, right? That is not a linear uh, graph, that's an exponential graph, meaning it's to the power of, right? That's how the doubling happens. So if you start with two, then it only takes a finite number of doubles for you to hit the first billion, provided that the growth is exponential, doubling. It may take, uh, I don't have the, yeah, the same people. If there's bacteria building up in this glass, imagine just for a, a moment, then it will take a fair bit of time, even if it's doubling, it may take days or weeks, depends on the, the, the rate of growth, for the bacteria to get to this level, right? But 
once the next doubling happens, then almost in an instant, overnight, the bacteria will be here. So half, it was half full and then it was completely full in a blink of an eye, right? And that is why exponential growth is deceptive. So, so th this is this is the 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 tech the, depends who you listen to, uh, and you don't want to be wrong about this. And I'm not saying one one of them is wrong versus the other. I'm not trying to. That's not my intention. What I'm saying is that the it depends on who you ask. The growth is either either happening exponentially or is not really happening, right? And uh, there are other things that each one of the sites says, uh, which I won't go into. Uh, because I think Peter Thiel has said things like, if we, like, I'm paraphrasing, I could be wrong. It was like also the era of deep fake, so who knows if he really said this or not. But Thiel also said, that if we, we need to push research in particular domains, and if there are negative consequences on a few subjects, human subjects, then it's a cost that we must, uh, you know, we, we should be, uh, we should still go ahead with, uh, with, uh, with, with that area of research. If I remember correctly, please somebody, please correct me. There's a serious uh, topic at this point or subtopic and uh, you know, but I, like it's not against sensationalist because you don't have to have human subjects. You can do lab on a chip. You, uh, you can uh, have better computational models with, with more computation. You can make more detailed uh, uh, simulations of the human uh, physiology. Uh, I, I know individuals are working on modeling uh, the molecular structure of certain cells. But what I don't know is if we have enough computation for us to be able to uh, do that on a, on a, on a, on a, on a uh, larger scale. And if we do, then degree to which you can do that. Can you model a finger? Because I'm sure that's going to have trillions and trillions of molecules and just a single finger. A lot of cells, but cells are made of molecules, right? And I mean, there's other questions too, the degree to which that simulation is going to be. But that's just like one example of the many, right? So, but, but to, come, to come back to the topic, what is the, what is the growth really looking like? Is it exponential? Or is the growth like, this like what what are we looking at or is it like this i i don't know it depends what you're talking about and how you're looking at it right so so that's that's one question right if the technological growth is exponential then we have one of the two models in the world right now or one of the three right or one of the four i would say you have the free and fair part of the world in random order, right? You have closed systems or somewhat closed systems, somewhat closed, somewhat authoritarian. Then you have the monarchies, which could also be closed or authoritarian, or they could be free, right? Monaco seems quite free to me, right? And I find out places like Germany and Sweden have monarchy, which is totally surprised me, but, uh, or, or something to that, like one of the multiple European countries. What else do you have? I don't want to put anarchy here because I'm not saying all anarchic systems are bad, but you have some of that in the world. Uh, where are, there are bad anarchic systems. Not all of them are bad, right? So like the decentralized movement is not bad, right? There may be some bad folks in there, there's bad folks in all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, 
is the degree to which that system is going to be transparent. Uh, but I won't talk about that right now. What else is there? Then there's a social, like within this range, you have, oh, where's the pop-up? Sorry, there's a chicken house. Oh, uh, so this in this range you have like multiple, you know, you have the libertarian, free market economy, capitalism as a base. You have social democratic structures. You could have a monarchy in there, or you could have like this. We have to see our libertarian monarchy. Who knows? Maybe you'll see some on Mars. What else? Uh, or just democracy, re representative democracy, or many different kinds of democracy. Okay. You could just have a democracy. Uh, social de democratic would be like more like the Nord Nordic model, Canadian, uh, Commonwealth. Uh, democ democratic uh, would be like US, pure democracy with free market economy, US, India. I have no idea how India's economic structure is set up, but it seems fairly open. Um, it's, it's not a closed market uh, for sure, right? Uh, South Korea would be an example here, I would think. Uh, so lots of examples like these, right? Uh, now, the thing is that all of these different ways are reliant on basic research. Okay. All of these systems and more are reliant on basic research, which is a trend or not a trend, sorry, not a trend. Well, it depends how you, what do you mean by trend? But this is a way of, like foundation that's powered civilization since the time of Galileo. But as more time has passed by, it has become more structured. And this has definitely picked up steam past the time of Newton, you know? So Isaac Newton, after, after that, we started seeing a lot of, you know, again, I'm not saying, you know, it's just Newton. There was many other folks and many other things that happened. Printing press was invented. Uh, ships were more, uh, the navigation systems were invented. Uh, many other things happened. Railroads came into effect. And but the pace at which information has been uh, transfer is something that has picked up pace. And that as that has happened, then the, 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 the mechanism for uh, the, the research uh, experimentation base is something that has been replicated in almost every part of the world, uh, minus the exception being the parts of the world that have yet to come in contact with civilization. So it's the degree to which a part has come in contact with civilization. And I mean civilization as a, a anthropological definition of the word, you know, going back to the Sumerians, but I'm talking in a more modern context. Maybe the Sumerians and the Egyptians were doing science. I am not privy of that personally, I don't know. But um, there's less of research or no research, depending on what I share. So if you go in the middle of the Amazon jungle, probably is pretty low that a contact, uncontacted tribe is doing the scientific method, right? So I guess you get the, get the point. But so to come back to these different systems, the, the, the question is, what is happening to the scientific basic, the, 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 the research base? So what is happening to, what is the rate at which science and technology is progressing. Is it like this or is it like 
this? Is it like this? I don't I have no idea, right? I, I don't know how you, how, you, how you look at this. Is it the number of patents submitted? Is the number of quality patents that appear of you? Is it um, something else? That remains to be seen, right? But, but the thing that is clear is that there's a couple of things that are clear. One is this would be absolutely uh, a really bad thing to ignore. I would say that, you know, again, like you can have progress. You can have progress, scientific and technological, in a closed society. We know this when we look around the world. We know this for a fact, right? But the thing is, if the free part of the world continues to ignore scientific research, then what will happen to freedoms and liberties? That is the question. So I guess this is why I was thinking two parts to this. And when I was thinking of, I've done, I've tried to like record this video eight times, uh, but but what I've been thinking like big, 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 big uh, link of this scientific research and technological base with freedoms and liberties, right? And um, uh, historically, when I've thought about this, there's like a lot of ego attached, uh, a fair bit of ego. But, you know, may say in our minds prevail and uh, we can, uh, all sides can work on uh, establishing norms and behaviors. There's, a, uh, there's an institute out of uh, Waterloo, Kishner Waterloo, working on uh, this for space security. Uh, but I feel something like that could be applied in every domain. So you have to have like a communication. Uh, you have to establish rules, norms, and behaviors that everyone will adhere to. And just because you can break a rule, um, it doesn't mean you should, um, particularly when it comes to human lives and or the quality of human lives. So at this point in the conversation, I'm really, and I'm not saying it's me saying this, but I feel like there's weight attached to what I'm saying because we should not develop technologies to hurt each other. Uh, and I feel if the rate or the growth for technology is indeed exponential, then we'll all have superpowers on our fingertips and our hands, uh, metaphorical sense. And so we should leverage this ph phenomena, for lack of a better word, to bring more hope and healing to the world and not develop complex weapons. Who knows what could happen if you keep going down that path? That opens up a different spectrum. Uh, going back to World War II, when if you hypothesize just for a second, not hypothesize, uh, if you just think that the proliferation would have continued as opposed to what happened with the Atoms for Peace, which is a talk that former American President Dwight, Mr. President Dwight D. Eisenhower gave at the United Nations. So Atoms for Peace, oops, I'm, I was started writing Atoms for Atoms. Uh, Atoms for Peace was a talk again that uh, Mr. Dr. Mr. Uh, President Eisenhower, I mean, it, it is what it says, right? So the alternative was, it could have put a human on a path towards extinction. Uh, it's naive to think you can have a nuclear exchange today and that everything is gonna be okay. It's not gonna be okay, it's gonna be nuclear winter. A lot of people are gonna die then other folks are gonna die because of the nuclear winter. So anyways, I don't wanna talk about all that right now. I don't wanna go into the, uh, 
because they're all, these are all spectrums, right? So, and I'm not doing a very good job making the maps, um, but I want to bring it back to basic research and uh, whatever the reason may be, it's the, the wars um, or I don't want to spend, I don't want to move from issue to issue that fast uh, because I do think about war and peace a lot without going into the details. Uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, oh, sorry, I, I meant to say, I, I think I've thought about issues related to, uh, issues related to war and peace a fair bit. And I've, th I've thought about issues related to war and peace a lot because I've grown up in Pakistan, a little bit of time in Saudi Arabia when I was a kid and obviously in Canada for 22 years now. So I, I've talked very deeply about what makes people fight. And it, it wasn't like I didn't understand any one of the narratives 100%. But that's another conversation. At this point, I consider myself, or have considered myself for a while to be very North American centric or Western centric, but I always take a step back and ask myself, I ask myself if my actions and my thoughts have done, have brought more healing to the world to the contrary, and if then, 100% honesty, uh, if I, you know, I've done a lot of good, put a lot of content out, shared a lot of ideas. But also on the contrary, if I feel that it is to the contrary, then I meditate on that at the very least. I, I let it sit somewhere and then I think about it. At least think about it, and I, pro I, I just don't keep thinking about it. I process it, talk to somebody who I believe I should be talking to, not just friends and family. So yeah, this is this is the this is the real deal, right? And uh, you know, uh, going forward, do <laughs> good. Uh, for the benefit of all. Uh, so yeah, this is what I wanted to talk about. This was kind of like a detour, but that's where some of these thoughts are coming from, I guess. Because I, I want good things to happen for everyone, including in uh, the closed authoritarian part of the world. Because there are humans living in the closed authoritarian part of the world that are just like us. And like the Stoics would say, we should love those humans because we must empathize with their suffering. And it, it, we must think what it must be like to for, for them to suffer, right? And the Stoics don't talk about this, but only through communications. Communications. Are we gonna be in a capacity to be able to help each other? And so to help reduce the suffering of somebody, we have to start communicating with them first. And communicating means First, seek to understand, then be understood. I'm not going to write that down. That's from Stephen Covey. And then communicating involves a lot of listening, acting, active listening at that. And then communicating also involves the five to one uh, method by John Gottman, whereby you do five things for somebody. I've thought of things for somebody before you make them ask. 
and the probability of that ask converting into a yes is higher if you do the five to one. So communication involves, uh, this is not a comprehensive list, but it also involves frequent touch points. You know? uh, there's other aspects involved with it is the degree to which you communicate. Uh, you know, you want to be mindful of how thoughts, means, ways of being are going to kind of like how that mix is going to happen. So you got to have, you know, some semblance there. It's a complicated topic, but on, 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 on principle, it's quite simple. That you got to architect uh, the strategies for communications. I really don't think in, uh, in the era that we're in that there's any other way, right? So, but that doesn't mean you are going to be soft, right? So I hope my words are not taken out of context. But so this is, this is the thing, right? So if, let me clear this out. So going back, if the technological progress is like this, just imagine it is, then you have one side, then you have another side. And if this becomes a non-communicative uh, hostile environment, right? H O S T I L E. Uh, and the, the the degree to which it becomes both non-communicative and hostile increases the probability that something really bad could happen, right? And that something really bad would then be on a spectrum. And not as a sensationalist that something really bad could be extinction of humans, ex, extinction uh, uh, like a cold war kind of a thing would be a best case scenario. I, I would think, I'm not sure, right? Because we're talking about defining the bad, what could be the bad? So, because what's happening is the technologies are still being developed and the sciences are still being researched, right? Nobody's really stopping on it. Like some sides may be funding it less versus the other, and they are not maybe thinking of, of immigration as much or, but that's a trend that's been going on for hundreds of years. It's not gonna stop, right? Uh, like one side could be a little shaken and they may forget about some of the pillars. But it, like basically what I'm saying is in the abs absence of the communication and uh, for the, uh, for the uh, environment to become increasingly hostile, th th this could uh, open, op op this could increase the probability. I don't know what the actual symbol for that is when you it have a probability increase. I, I don't know. This could open up this uh, this this thing, right? There are some. There are some. Let me save this and clear this. There are some who argue, and again, let's imagine this is still exponential. There are some who argue that conflict. can be a uh, promoter of or driver of progress. All right. Um, who has said this? Many folks have said this. Um, I can't take names because I'm not 100% sure. But uh, th this is a um, this is a actual uh, thing that is studied, and I don't have a military background, so I can't expand on this at all, or a historian or a technology futurist. Uh, I would feel though that 
the current dynamic of technological advancement is, I would, I'm thinking it's on an exponential curve. Um, because you have to do this dance in your mind, whereby if you, if you have to like do a forced contradiction, uh, then you gotta ask yourself, what what if it's, uh, what if what if what if you're wrong? What, what if you're wrong? If you're, that is wrong, like it's not exponential, um, right? What would be the cost or the repercussions of making that having thinking that way, right? What if you think that the pace of change is exponential? when in fact the pace of change is something that is to your detriment, right? So there's all these thoughts, but to, to come back uh, to the, the topic of the conflict driving progress, if the rate of change is indeed exponential, then uh, going with this line of thinking whereby entertaining, promoting, inciting, or outright creating conflict in order to drive progress, could again, open up that spectrum between a cold war to extinction. Uh, because uh, the domains that we are talking about are domains that are not in the in it's not kinetic anymore uh it could involve kinetic stuff for lack of a better word again i'm not military but so i can i can only say that from my limited vantage point and um the thinking based on a very very finite number of people that I've talked talk, spoken to from many backgrounds, multiple backgrounds at least, cultural and religious or non-religious. Uh, I haven't, I've yet to see like an atheist have this opinion. Actually, no, I, 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 I gotta take, take that back. But, uh, but tr traditionally atheists are not like, uh, Statistically, statistically speaking, I don't feel they are of have extreme views, but I have seen or observed very limited uh, uh, data, data sets. But I have heard people say. Like it's a very military kind of uh, dominance kind of um, approach. Uh, and uh, some of the people are even, it's, it's, it's very dom dominating and uh, at any cost, right? But the, those are some of the people in my immediate kind of biological family. Uh, anyhow, so uh, I just wonder how many people think that a conflict could, could emerge uh, and uh, it's a zero-sum game in, in that situation. The technology is scaling and one side is going to lose. I don't think people stop and realize how many ways something like a global conflict at this point in time, how many ways could it go wrong, right? So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, again, in terms of 100% radical honesty, the place where we are today in the collective new sphere, new sphere means like a collection of all the thoughts, ideas, and what's going on in the collective, in the human collective, however reality is structured, uh, assuming this is our own bubble and it has no influence from the outside, right? 
No. So if that's not happening, this is our the collection of what we think, do, and have done for depends how far back we want to go, at least since the origin of civilization. But we all have had a contribution to where we are today. And I feel, I, this is my sense, that there is like, uh, this is a system and it has pressure points, okay? And this is my thinking, I could be wrong, I'm sharing stuff, but I'm really not sure what I'm talking about. You know? Like if th there's parts of my body, right? You know that when you do the, this is a bad example. I'll give, I'll give two examples, actually. Uh, one in, in working force and one in working gentle stuff. If you, like, you know, when you do the martial arts and you, they touch you somewhere and then the person just like drops. So I feel that is true for our reality too, right? And th this is like in more in the domains of strategy, but so that's one. The other, so the, uh, the, so this is not good or bad, but the other one is where you have a breakthrough with somebody and you're trying a lot of different approaches. But when, once you have the right intel about the, the thing, entity, person in front of you, and you approach them with that thing, and you, you have a breakthrough, something gets across. And that's so beautiful. It can be quite beautiful, right? You can have that in your personal relationships, uh, and having a civil discourse in a, nation state, nation state, or region, region, right? Something gets through, like whether it's the, the wall coming down in Germany or um, what else? Uh, you know, the apartheid ending in South Africa uh, to peace prospect breaking out in, uh, in uh, UK with the IRA in, uh, between the English. Or the British government and uh, IRA. So you have these breakthroughs, right? Um, but yeah, this is becoming quite abstract. But what I'm saying, but I, I do believe this that we are here where we are today. And this is not any one person's, one individual's fault, right? This is also off topic, but I feel that systems that are unsteady. They, um, they tend to make somebody or someone a scapegoat. And we have seen this over and over again in history. We saw this in World War II. Uh, we see this over and over again. You know, we've seen this. Uh, this is happening right now in a lot of places in the world. Uh, and uh, this could be happening all over, uh, possibly. But uh, I don't know, man, this is gonna, this become very abstract because I was only gonna talk about the uh, basic research. But basically what I'm saying is that scientific research and technological advancement can either be used, again, to bring hope and healing to the world, or it could put us towards a path that may, from which there potentially could be no return. With a caveat that I really don't know much about this, this part right here, right? This part, right? I personally feel that you can have a lot of innovation, good innovation and growth without necessarily invoking conflict because, and there's this different schools of thought on this. One, there's, you know, one random school believes for there to be order in the system you also need to have this order, right? Um, I don't know about chaos theory to be able to expand on this, but I guess it's the degree to which you wanna have the disorder in the system, which would also, I don't know if that's true, but I think you can overall have quite healthy realities. Um, without something like this to happen, right? But uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I can't expand too much on this. I think I've spoken a fair bit about this. This is very abstract. <coughs> I'm going to stop sharing for a second, then I'm going to share again because I have my personal notes in here. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is prosperity. So when we talk about prosperity, for you to power all of this and for you to be able to power all of this and more, you need continually rising levels of prosperity. I am not an economist. I never would claim to be one unless I actually am an economist. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely getting tired. <laughs> The, the thing is, excuse me, sorry about that. The thing is that right now we are, uh, right now we're just talking about science, right? But I was thinking about this, like, because I, 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 like, uh, I did, I, I, I tried recording the, the same video a couple of times. But then today I was thinking, hold on there's a problem that's like one of the things we that needs to have the right attention energy love going in there the scientific research is the other thing is we we're still converting nature into wealth so even if we go back and fix this which we have to right and i haven't looked at the numbers i must say right but you can't forget about this because Civilization cannot sustain without the scientific research base. It's it's a it's a given. Uh, even if you have like some advanced AGI, it's going to leverage the scientific method in order to architect what you want it for. But like that's a different, completely different conversation. But so the, this is a, this is off topic. But because we are turning nature into wealth. We need to think about how long will this, how, how what, what's really going to happen with these models, right? Because, so I've, I've made other videos on this topic. And uh, I, again, not to sound all that, but. Like if you look at one of my more recent videos, um, let's just give it a second. It's gonna boot up any second now. So in the in the biggest problem, biggest opportunities, uh, was it the biggest problem with your opportunity? Hold on, give it a second. Yeah, in, in the biggest problem, biggest opportunities, I shared that article from the BBC, uh, whereby we're, we're talking about, because there's a couple of things happening. You have seven point something billion people right now on a single planet. A lot of the folks, I don't want to like draw a graph because it's going to seem like that growth is exponential. That's not what I'm trying to signify here, but you have a steady movement into the urban landscape and, uh, even with COVID, this trend is not going to go that way, right? It's, it's going to slow down for a little bit, maybe, but it doesn't look like people are going to start moving back into the rural areas. So this trend is going to continue. People are going to continue moving into the cities. As people continue moving into cities, they are going to need more goods and services. And as people need more goods and services, what's again happening is that we have been converting nature into wealth, right? So the question is, and... Uh, this this has nothing to do with the limits movement or anything like that but 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 the question is what's going to happen to uh nature right and there's different schools of thoughts on this uh in starting in random order one school of thought is that there's going to be enough gains on the genetics Actually, it's like more like this, right? 
genetics, artificial intelligence, one of the texts, robotics, another one of the texts, and space. Okay. One school thought is that there's going to be enough gains in these areas in order for us to maybe, I don't know if this is like an actual school of thought, but I've heard some one person say this. So we may not have to rely on nature at all, right? Right? So that's one school. It depends, depends how you look at this. The other school of thought is that if the wilderness die, right? then we die in the domain of uh, e ecology, right? So kind of, kind of, sort of, right? Biosphere. So if there's no, because if you don't have, because it's, it's all interconnected, it's a chain, right? It's all a chain. The photoplankton or whatever uh, that feed off the poop of the whale, uh, if the whales die, then they're not going to get their nutrients, which means all the other fish are going to die. Uh, if there are no eagles or wolves or foxes, there's going to be rabbits and other things running all over the place. They're going to eat all the grass. It's going to become a desert eventually, and then the rabbit population is going to collapse. This is systems dynamic, right? So that's another school of thought, right? And it, it, I guess this is a... This is a um, this is a spectrum. And within this one, there's things like the sixth extinction cycle, six major extinctions. Some people are saying we are now under the sixth one, right? There's all sorts of stuff, right? So who knows what's going to happen? Maybe we get some shocks, not necessarily from here, but maybe we're somewhere here on the spectrum, which is, this is, this is the, not that we're going to die, but when it comes to this is very abstract. This has become very abstract. But but when it comes to wilderness, definitely we have less and less as more time is passing by, right? So I don't know how you want to draw it. Uh, Sir David Attenborough has made a documentary about this. And the actual percentage of wilderness on our planet has continued to plummet over the decades. Less of everything, less of fish, less of more, well, like sorry, less of wildlife in the rainforest, less of insects. We don't even have data for a lot of these things. We have no data on what the insect population is like around the world today compared to 60 or 70 years ago. But it does seem like there's a lot less in insects because if you look at the older movies, you would see like hordes of locusts coming in. That was a pretty common thing going back 40, 50 years in movies. And now you barely see that unless it's like on some alien planet, right? So it, it's, it, this is a definite trend uh, whereby there's less of wilderness uh, because the human is an evolutionary animal that's evolved in the environment for an extended time period. It seems very inconceivable that the human is going to be able to survive on its own. Right? Unless our technology evolves to a state whereby we can just make whatever we want and fix our bodies however we need. Right? Even, even in such a scenario, is it a good trade off that we get rid of all the wilderness? I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's a good trade off because you have billions of years of evolution that has powered this. And who knows how many patterns have been tried and tested, right? How many patterns, how many patterns? Because what we, what, what we witness here is a 1% of all the life that has ever resulted or has ever been. And, and that 1% is a representation of how many patterns that have been tried because a lot of things came about, went extinct, and different variations were tried. So that 1% represents a big number. Right, I'm not even just talking about the 99% that was that have gone extinct. But how much, how many patterns would have taken to power all of this? Right. So there could be, and, and, and within that 1%, there's there's things we are we could spend a lot of time making sense out of. 
medicines, therapies, what have you. Anyway, so that's, that's another way of looking at this. So to come back to turning nature into wealth, This has become very abstract, but you know, people do this for a living. And I've spoken about this in the past in some of my previous videos. This fellow is a, uh, well, he's an American fellow now. I don't know where he was originally born, but I have no idea. Uh, but the name is Safa Motashare. Uh, and he has created something that's called the Handu model. And what this model uh, is supposed to do is front like it's, it's supposed to signify what uh, the systems modeling for earth is going to look like contingent on what's going on in our surroundings with our, uh, with, our with nature right so he's computed uh, the carrying capacity with regards to what you see on the screen i hope these are in the creative commons image so there's different models that have come about. I haven't looked a lot into his studies. I haven't even read his uh, papers. But uh, however you look at it, if we are looking at, I think what he has to factor though is the, the rise of technology, right? But again, like I said, I don't think that's a good trade-off. So, so I don't know how he runs the simulation, but you cannot have an ever increasing population without the means and ability to be able to have a biosphere that supports that. So the question is what's really gonna to happen to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to us, right? So even though we should support the scientific research base, this is the other question, we should not what we should do is what I've shared. And it's, it looks like I have a stake or an agenda here. I definitely have a bias attached to us moving most of our agriculture and industry away from the planet. I definitely have a bias for that, uh, for good reasons, for, uh, for reasons that are going to be good for my daughter's future, my future at that. You know, there's a degree to how effectively we can scale this uh, but I don't I don't think it's a good idea to keep turning more of the nature into wealth and so if there was a gist for the, the video today uh, is that without the means and ability to be able to power the scientific research base the basic research uh, base um, uh, you, you cannot really have, uh, we need to do that in order to be able to have a viable uh, civilization whereby there is prosperity for many, if not all, there's upward mobility and that there's lots of opportunities for everyone. Uh, if you don't do that, then you get shocks. And uh, there's a couple of things that are percolating right now and uh, you know, there's one is the, the research angle. The other one is the automation aspect. And there's different schools of thought on it. One is that new jobs are gonna get created. The other one is that this is the trend that is just gonna keep getting better and all jobs are eventually gonna get automated. So you have to pretty much create a very different society. So these things are coming at us and we need to talk about this and have cushions in place if these things actually happen. But today's uh, conversation, if I may, was very simple as to support the uh, pillar of basic research. Uh, and I kind of shared how it's historically been funded. Uh, originally, it goes, it depends how far back you want to go. If you want to go back hundreds of years, like, you know, starting with somebody like the Medici's, then at, at, at in those times in the in the, in the very early uh, era of uh, modern science, when Galileo uh, published the books, uh, that, that was a different time, right? So you have to realize that uh, it was a different society and a different uh, set of norms and behaviors and ethics were practiced. 
but you still have patterns for science at, at, at that time. And uh, the, uh, the Medici family were one of them. Uh, and they took, uh, Galileo was one of their patrons. And so was uh, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci was uh, adopted by the, the Medici family from an early age in the early teenagers, uh, treated as one of their own as their children. Uh, and then Galileo is the teacher children. So I, I, I don't know if they were both in the same timeline. I don't, I don't I haven't looked into that. But um, uh, the uh, his historical precedent was in a nutshell, uh, private patrons. Then as um, you had reforms as it relates to how governments function and uh, the other, some of the other trends I mentioned uh, the, the rate of literacy in uh, Europe went up uh, 40% uh, or like some significant percentage in a, like a decade. Uh, it was a very short amount of time and rapid rise in lit rates of literacy. And that was thanks to the, the press, uh, the printing press. Uh, I forget it was Gutenberg or the other. Um, so you, you had developments like this and, 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 and uh, uh, obviously there were the Renaissance and people started looking into, uh, you know, um, basically uh, a new way of thinking, right? Because a lot of the things that uh, humans believed prior to that uh, were uh, proved to be incorrect. Like the earth doesn't, uh, the sun doesn't go around the earth and earth is not the center of the universe, things like that thanks to Copernicus and uh, maybe some of Kepler's work, but definitely Copernicus. Uh, and um, with, with this new kind of thinking, um, there was also kind of like a seg segue or, or like the religion and uh, state started kind of like a, 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 there was a, a, the enablement of, uh, constitution uh, or ways of being whereby uh, religious edict was not the way to make all the decisions. And so this opened up a lot of uh, room for uh, a new kind of thinking. And uh, I would think that the uh, enablement of the scientific research base uh, in a modern sense uh, started around that time after Galileo. And so, again, coming back to what I was saying, so it went from like private to the governments getting more interested in this. And um, I'm pretty sure that throughout the centuries, different governments, or even the past 200 years, uh, different governments have had a contribution to how science uh, ought to be, uh, or not ought to be done, but uh, how uh, just like contribution to science in general and however the budgets have been allocated. So we have seen that trend continue pretty much till uh, the past, uh, since now. But when it comes to the actual portion of how governments allocate money for basic research, we're beginning to see a deline delineation, like a, a shift away from that. And uh, this has created a gap. And this gap is now, uh, I, I, don't, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but say this is uh, institution, like say this is the United States, right? And this is the total amount of money de dedicated towards basic research, right? Let's just say, this is all the money that has been dedicated for basic research. C-A-R-C-H. Now, as time has gone by, the government's share of this, I don't know what it actually has looked like historically. So if this was the somewhere in the middle, right? So see, um, going back 25 years, this was the share of like the government's expenditure, or maybe it was like this, right? So you had like more than 60, 70% uh, came from the taxpayer money. Uh, 
but as time has gone by, the share has shrunk, right? And it keeps shrinking. And these are not actual numbers. And as this has happened, as the share is shrinking for basic research, what is happening is that private donors are stepping in where government research, uh, government expenditure is not flowing into uh, this, 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 for this, this area, the basic research area. And uh, for the better part, this is a trend that is being witnessed for uh, all of the Western governments. And so, you know, there's different schools of thought on how uh, this uh, should actually be structured. Uh, you know, as you can see, when you just Google things like basic research, moving to private funding, you come across all kinds of uh, reports, uh, why it needs for public and private support, which makes rational sense, depends on how you, uh, how you exercise that, who controls the IP and for what reasons and the rates, like all the proportions and ratios, right? Uh, but I was kind of looking at this, but I wish they didn't use all caps. I have no idea. I have no idea. I just kind of didn't spend a lot of time there. Um, historically, I've read like I think I've read this article you know, from uh, it picks up the cash or something. I remember going through something like this. This is becoming very abstract, but what I'm trying to say is like quite simple. That you need uh, you need you need attention. Um, I think I've read this article: billionaire with big ideas of privatizing American science. Uh, I think one of the uh, yeah, so some people are calling it the golden era of private science fund funding, right? Others are saying this is the worst enemy for science, corporate funding. Uh, so it depends who you list, like who you tune into. Um, so if if we now talk about, and I'm going to close on this note, if we if you talk about the government expenditure on R and D, then that money is coming from somewhere, right? So we're, I guess the question is, where is that money coming from? And that's a good question. Is it coming from taxpayers' money? Is it coming from like who are you talking about? Individual taxpayer, corporate taxpayers? Is it coming? Will it come from uh, taxing the wealthy? Uh, you know, and there's pros and cons and. Uh, costs associated with each one of these decisions. Um, so I, I feel overall it's a very serious and important topic, if I may. And uh, I, uh, however things are gonna be in the future, I, I, I have different schools of thought on things like, one of the things I think about is the distractions. So uh, even when you were kind of going through the examples of basic research and applied research, I, I was kind of thinking about this, like, cause when we talk about G-A-N-R-S-S, -S, right? You have particular verticals that you talk about. And uh, I think this has been a sub thought that has emerged uh, in, in the collective. And there are reasons I would think why this sub thought has emerged. And I would think I'm not a historian, but uh, basically follow the money, right? So if you follow the money, um, it's typically the Americans that take a lead in any given area, typically, typically. And then everyone kind of jumps on the same thing because they want to probably replicate the same things. However things work without going into the details, I don't know how things work. But uh, then you have this whole flurry of activity, right? Because everyone's trying to copy each other. But uh, what I'm saying is, If you follow the money, then particular areas have received funding, uh, which has pushed development in that area, continually pushed development in that area to the next level. 
And some of those areas include, but this is not a comprehensive list. So this is not all limited to, but so for example, the, uh, the brain initiative during President Obama, that has received a lot of funding uh, historically. I don't remember the numbers and I don't know the uh, actual reason for that in terms of, I didn't map that development going before it or after that, there was a big sum of money that went in there. I don't know if it has a correlation with the wars uh, because of, yeah, I don't wanna explore that right now. So, yeah, so, so the, 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 the brain initiative is one area. The other one is, uh, there, are, there are others I can think of, right? Uh, different uh, areas in the domain of energy, because we, we all know we're gonna run out of fossil fuel at some point. Uh, science fiction writers like Isaac Asimov have been warning about this for um, since the 80s. There's a video of Asimov, what's his face, by the way, nobody's familiar with how Asimov, how do you get this filter to work? There we go. Right. So Asimov was of the opinion, uh, in this case, not talking about fiction, but Isaac Asimov was the opinion that we're gonna run out of oil. And uh, that was his prediction in the eighties. But since then we have come up with techniques like fracking and whatnot. Uh, that's a different conversation. Like that's a classic trolley problem with oil. I don't really see it as a trolley problem because if the, the uh, because you look at the state of the ocean, what's going on with ocean, ocean acidification, you got like 70% of the Great Barrier Reef dead. You got dead zones popping up all over, uh, all over the coast. But this has more to do with nutrient uh, density or the rich amount of nutrients that are being pumped through the river systems. Um, but uh, ocean acidification and climate in general is part per million is like a big, but that's a little off topic, right? What I was talking about the follow the money. So in the domain of that, there's brain initiative, there's different rounds of funding for different kind of energy breakthroughs. Uh, we're talking government funding right now. And then uh, there are other areas uh, where successive decades, um, it feels like that has stopped. Uh, this is very uneducated what I'm saying right now. It feels like that stopped with uh, President Barack Obama's presidency in an American context. And because everybody pretty much follows what the Americans are doing by and large, at least up until this point in history, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? Maybe Asia will become the center of scientific research and development. It remains to be seen. But uh, it seems like, again, this trend has it's uh, stalled at the very least. Because if you look at the money and the proportion in regards to the government expenditure in R&D, and this is a question of policy, analytics, you don't need deep analytics, you're just gonna figure out like where is the money, what's the money being spent on? Why is it not being spent on basic research? It could also be a question of uh, maybe like uh, this uh, the, the subplot that I was talking about that like it depends how you look at it, but too, like too many people believing that GAN RSS are going to be driving all of the growth. So all of the money and the talent and everything is going into these fields. 
But what if it, what if that turns out to be not true? Right? Why, why would society may take an either or approach, put all the eggs in one basket? when uh, something could happen, right? Anything could happen. I hope bad things don't happen. But what if that doesn't turn out to be the driver of growth? So the, the right thing to do is to fund basic research across the board, fix the taxation system, um, you know, have effective immigration in place. So you have a steady input of uh, technologists, researchers, uh, driving growth, uh, and 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 fix the education system at, at the same time, so that you have uh, basically everybody wins, right? Because we we don't want uh, the the conversation specific to excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, a lot of penis today. <laughs> um, the, the conversation specific to identity politics is a uh, can be a controversial issue. Uh, I don't. Oh, I don't think I turn. I, I think well. I don't think my views are toxic. At least I you know, don't think that way. That this kind of people are better, or that kind of people are. You know, something like this. Uh, but I, I feel the issue of identity politics is creating big problems, particularly with regards to when you look at the vote culture and like, if I don't agree with you, I can just, you know, I don't even know what this whole thing is, like cancel culture. I just learned about what vote culture means. It's like people getting really angry when you uh, kind of, ask them a question even, right? It's a degree to how you do that though, because I don't want to walk down the street and people coming up to my face and bothering me. People have done that to me in a corporate setting, uh, but that goes back almost 15 years. And the word is not influencing my thinking because the word's right there. But uh, yeah, but, but, but this, this is getting uh, it's like going super off topic. But what I'm, what I'm really talking about is uh, so to come back is like just some semblance of the important uh, need to sustain uh, the scientific research base. And I hope, I don't know what the reasons is, maybe it's because of social media and everyone's on apps and games and whatnot, they're totally distracted. Maybe people are not reading as many books anymore. Uh, I, I have no idea what the answer is because I'm not a sociologist or anthropologist. I don't monitor data set related to these studies, if these studies are even happening at all. Uh, but the, 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 you know, the, the, you counter that kind of these kind of thoughts with the thought that 90% or something like that scientists that have ever lived are living today in this day and age. So I guess it's just, I guess it's a question of semblance and common sense and uh, just allocating the right amount of energies and the proportions to the reach areas that power civilization. And so if you want to civil, if you want to power prosperity, then you need to invest in uh, area in basic research, right? And I am not a scientist, and I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a policy guy or girl or person. But that's it. That's I think I've I, I've, I think I've explored the realms that I've, from my limited vantage point, I feel uh, should be explored. And uh, overall, may saner minds prevail. And uh, you know, we don't we don't want to be uh, Carl Sagan once said, it's a, I don't want to end on this note, but uh, it's in the book, The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. And while well, Sagan's prophecy was about the United States, I would never want this to happen to any country, particularly the United States. And I would not want this to happen to any country. But uh, Sagan was saying, 
I foresee a future where uh, people in government don't understand the, I'm paraphrasing. Why am I paraphrasing? Let me Google the actual quote. Give me one second. I don't want to end on this note, but this is a prediction from Carl Sagan, who was a scientist and a uh, science educator and highly respected across government and uh, academia and the general public, if you ever saw the original Cosmos series. So the quote from Carl Sagan is that he, I, Carl Sagan, have a foreboding of in America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy when nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers, and here we have the power, sorry, when awesome technological powers have slipped away to other countries, sorry, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issue, grasp the issue, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystal, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide, almost noticing back into superstition and darkness. Then there's some stuff missing and then the quote continues. The dumbing down of America is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media. The 30 second sound bites, now down to 10 seconds or less. Lowest common denominator programming. Credulous presentations on pseudoscience and superstition, but especially a kind of celebration or ignorance. I think this is also from the same uh, ch chapter, but I, uh, I do not agree with the tags that are, uh, that the person put here. I, I, I have no idea who put these tags here. Um, cause I see folks who are evangelical talking about science, uh, promote like uh, science related topics like Kat, Kat, Kathy, or I don't know her personally, Catherine Hayhoe. I have no, I didn't see all the tags here. I just Googled this. I have no idea who Rupert Murdoch is. I think it's this guy in news. Hello from, okay. anyways, I don't want to get the tag and be the, that the distraction, but this is Carl Sagan's, uh, the prediction now this is not all doom and gloom. You know, Carl Sagan is very he was a very smart fellow, but you know these uh, what what he said was not in binding. It's not set in stone. Uh, 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 like a largely service or information economy is not a bad thing. Um, it, it, and when it comes to manufacturing. Um, I, I will not comment on this right now because I have a stake in this and uh, it's not my personal stake, but I, I feel that humans, not just American or Americans or China or like some other part of the world, you know, it's like clusters of manufacturing is mostly uh, China, uh, Southeast Asia in general, Mexico historically, uh, Taiwan, other places like this, maybe a little bit Japan, some in Europe, uh, in North, North America. But I, I, like, I would want to see uh, manufacturing move away from it. Like this is more like Jeff Bezos' vision of moving all the heavy industry away from it. And we have today the technology uh, to do that. Um, awesome technological powers are in the hand of the few. I don't know how uh, this works, so I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, I would say science is really transparent, 
So you can download code, other data, pretty much anywhere. So, hey, uh, no one in the no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. Um, I don't know. Um, depends how you look at it. I don't know how. You know how how do you look? How do you define this? How many people have the time? the capacity and the genuine willingness to want to be more politically engaged. Why or why not uh, how do you become more engaged? Is it more engaged in regards to uh, the office of the representative that uh, you have a congruence of values with? Uh, is it that coupled with the fact that you watch C-SPAN? Is it that plus how much time you dedicate as a volunteer or in some other capacity. Um, you know, it's your, uh, it's also includes things like your ability to be able to, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, there's certain precepts that go towards making and uh, enabling an informed citizen those are the kind of things that are like you got to be literate first of all at least have the ability to read and write basic literacy uh you got to have basic uh, reading writing and arithmetic skills look at some numbers you know simple stuff right no, no, not even uh, high school level but just like grade eight kind of level reading writing arithmetic to be uh, uh able to make sense uh, in a, in a, in a in a, in, a, in, a, in a basic sense. And then, then how you arrive at those conclusions? Is it through like who said what, or is it through reason? I mean, like how much of uh, reason do you leverage in order to make sense out of stuff? Which I'm like kind of, I guess I'm talking about the next item when people have lost their ability to set their own agendas or knowledge, knowledge of the question, those in authority. Um, this is what I was talking about, like, you know, what, how are we creating the technology nowadays? Uh, we're creating technology in a conscious manner. Uh, how are we creating everything, really? Like a society, a technology, a, um, a, a city, a community. Uh, do you care? Uh, do you care about people living in tents in your city? Uh, do you care uh, about how the system is doing overall? Uh, if, uh, what, 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 what is housing affordability looking like? How is the country doing with regards to GDP per capita? What's going on with the, uh, with, 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 uh, the distressed communities? Uh, what's going on with uh, these? These are just like examples, and I'm not picking and choosing favorites. Like, it's just what comes to my mind. But uh, you know, how 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 engaged are you with folks in your surrounding who may not have the same outlook on life, uh, political, religious, or to the contrary, like you? It could be so anything. It could be anything, right? How, so so these are these are the kind of questions I would say. Uh, that are attached to what I see, uh, may not, uh, right? So, um, yeah, well, this also includes how available people in authority are, the elected representatives. Uh, that's, that's, I feel like, um, I, I don't, I don't see a lot of, uh, elected representatives talking about the issues that are potentially coming down the line, like the issue of basic research um, or the issues that are here right now, uh, like uh, the same issue of basic research, uh, effective foreign policy, effective immigration, uh, affordable housing, uh, the, the, what else? Um, Automation's impact on the workforce, like uh, basic income. We did a pilot project here in Ontario. The new government, provincial government, came in, and they canceled the project. Um, 
So uh, change, humans becoming a multi-planetary civilization, safeguards in effect for some of the areas that we uh, touch base on. Uh, research again, <laughs> right? So, uh, and I feel that this happens because of at least in the Canadian context, and I'm going with only one or two sample size, like one or one example, because on one of the elected representative website, I looked at, they said, this is how many emails we received and this is how many phone calls we did. So I did the math and it came to like some significant number. There was like a couple of dozen, I don't even remember. There was a lot of emails per day and a lot of phone calls per day. So I was thinking, okay, well, these are all the emails and phone calls and these are all the issues. So, and I won't get too many, I'm like, I'm like, maybe that's the reason why they're not thinking of these issues. And then I, when I look at the police cars, when I first moved to Canada, there were always two, if I remember correctly, two police people, not policemen, police people, police folks in a car but now there's only one. And I always ask myself, how, how must they feel? They, they've got to have a backup, man. You can't just try to save money on things like this, not be mindful and conscientious of the feelings of the people on the front line. Anyways, so these, these are the other, uh, like, like, so, like, there's a lot to be grateful for. I'm not ungrateful. I'm just saying that I'm just, I'm just trying to, I, I try to think about things from a systems perspective, but I also, Sometimes I complain, but I try, I try to like, don't take that personally, like, like burn a bridge or something like that. Cause I learned my lesson in the past. This is getting too abstract. But what I'm saying is that, um, I guess I made my point. Um, and the, there's other things happening here too. In the American dynamic, we're seeing more perceivably uh, kind of like uh, like uh, uh, it, 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 it was starting to become really chronic up until the last election cycles. But then we saw some really good, uh, uh, good act actions of goodwill and good gestures like uh, President George W. Bush Jr. Uh, came to uh, President Biden's uh, inaugural and I don't even watch uh, news or ceremonies like this. And uh, I uh, just gotta make money basically. <laughs> but, um, but that was a really nice gesture and, uh, you know, actions. So, why is So, that was a really nice gesture and I hope and wish and I don't pray, but I put good thoughts that there is a continued healing and understanding between the, they're the same, obviously the same people, man, <laughs> right? We're all the same people. So when I first came to North America, the political realities were so healthy. Uh, I, I used to watch a little bit of C-SPAN and I used to read the papers, the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, a uh, little bit of the sun. No, 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 Toronto sun. <laughs> a little bit. Of it. <laughs> it's more like a tabloid. It's not even like on the right or left. It's, uh, anyways, um, and I would uh, the Financial Post. I, I like. I, I, it's actually pretty, really. Uh, I, I enjoyed, uh, and then the others. I always read Newsweek ever since I was a teenager. A little bit of Time. Uh, and other periodicals. I never really got into the Economist for some reason. Uh, maybe I couldn't afford it, or well, it was only in the library. But anyway, so what I'm saying is that very healthy realities. It 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 seemed like perceivably from an outsider's perspective, perspective for both Canada and USA, it seemed like there's that very healthy political discourse, and you know conversation get a little vigorous even uh, in the Congress, how the parliament, but once the conversation is over, 
it, it might was perception that they're going to the pub afterwards uh, or, you know, just like a coffee shop, whatever, and just getting together and uh, asking each other how you were doing as the kids. And I, that's, I hope that's still happening. You know, I would, I would sense that happening more in a Canadian context. Um, I could be wrong, right? Uh, I, I would think the same is happening in the American context too. Uh, there's particular people in the government that are like just like one, wonderful people, like wonderful people throughout the decades. And when I think of myself and changing myself, you know, I think about those people, not to sound all that, because I appreciate living in Canada, right? I'm in North America, and uh, I really do. And I, I wish to see the world become like the North America. I mean, like we have incredible good happening on the continent. Uh, like my life improved exponentially when I came to North America. I could breathe. I was healthier. I could eat more protein at a price point that I, I, I could get a job <laughs> that paid me really well from every sense imaginable on the earthly standards. And my life changed so much and I learned so much on the job. I got a really good job at 19, 20 years old. Uh, working hard, like was obviously beneficial, uh, doing what you enjoy doing. But so much to be grateful for, clean water, there's security. Um, you can study anything you want. Um, parks are maintained, you know, landscape, the roads are paved, there's hydro at night. There are no mosquitoes. <laughs> there are list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? So that's the world we want to create, uh, not in a kind of agenda or like, you know, push because that word is there. <laughs> we are influenced by what's in front of us and knowing our environment. But just like in a calm, you know, like peace, like a, what's it called? Cooperative. Uh, mutually beneficial way I and mean, like in a, in a way that's fit for all, for all right so anyways Carl Sagan's like making other predictions that we're gonna, that society is going to become more superstitious um, critical faculties are going to be in decline and we're not going to be able to distinguish between what feels good and what's true that we're going to slide back into superstition and darkness well man I don't I don't see this happening you know just fix the uh, Fix the pillars. For uh, uh, I say this because uh, there's a former. Uh, I, I got this to Coach Mark Devine. His book is sitting there. I've yet to go through it. But uh, there's a fellow, there's a former DEA who spoke at the Mark Devine's Unbeatable Mind Summit, which I've never attended. I don't know Coach Mark Devine personally. I do not know him. Uh, but the fellow's name is. Uh, Amundsen, and he said, you, you see something about uh, what it takes to uh, sustain and reform a society. And I'm totally not going to be able to do justice here. But yeah, I'm not going to be able to do justice. But people, societies uh, evolve and not evolved, but societies thrive because people are deeply invested towards seeing each other do well. But what he was talking about is that there were, he was talking about it using a military reference, he, uh, but he was saying there is this group of people who do this for love and they don't do it for anything else. I'm not gonna do justice, like I said, and I'm not trying to portray myself as that fellow, but I, I do feel that uh, things are very good in North America because there have been consistently many people throughout the generations who have um, 
who've contributed energies towards making it so. And uh, that's really it. That's really it. You know what I mean? Uh, as you know, we got to have the capacity to keep on nurturing uh, what's good, spend time with our children, you know, teach them good things, and everything's going to be fine. Uh, I, having absorbed data to Dr. Peter D. Mandy's. Uh, a little bit of Steven Pinker, uh, a little bit from Hans Rodling. Uh, I am of the opinion that the world keeps getting better and better. Uh, but yeah, so I'm just looking at myself after being under the screen share. But the core pillars also need um, investment of time, energy, love, and capital in this case. <laughs> Because you can't uh, just, you know, you need to invest the capital towards sustain the cycles of basic boosters. So I'm very hopeful and optimistic of the future and for sustaining the cycles of scientific research uh, across the United States and Canada. There's some very smart people who are also of this mindset. And I'm not making this video because I want to just re replicate or mimic what they said. Uh, I genuinely believe this is a very important issue. I've spoken about this and made content, and I always uh, bring this conversation up again. I have looked at the data set. And again, like I said, when I looked at the data set in the past, I had a little bit of ego attached to that, um, which was not healthy. So I started thinking of this as like this side versus that side. But the right and the good thing to do is for everyone to just focus on this and and to uh, develop technology for uh, you know uh, healing the sick, uh, helping the elderly, uh, like is the situation with my parents right now. Man, amazing institution, the, the Canadian institution, uh, huge, huge facilities for elders. Like I don't even have the words of how how good the service is. And so this is, these are the kind of, and I, you know, I, I could probably speak about this for the next little while, but this video has become longer. Um, yeah, I got So what I'm saying is, you know, I think there's many ways of being in, on this planet. You can have different systems of governance and of, uh, economic systems at that. And there are issues, there are problems uh, because some systems don't operate as um, with this, you have a different set of ethics or uh, ways of doing things, but also some systems choose to be uh, less transparent versus others. And I don't, that being said, I don't really think there is a perfect system. And that being said, I also think that all the systems have made mistakes. Uh, some, uh, you know, uh, it's, and, and they're not some more than others. They all, they, all systems have made mistakes, big and small. And one last thing I'm going to say, I don't want to end on this note, is when you look at a dynamic, I feel this, I could be wrong. But when it's, it's I think it, this is related to individual psychology. I was thinking about this, uh, I thought about this on and off. But I feel like when you peer deep into somebody's psyche, you're like, you kind of see yourself in there. I don't know if this makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm not doing a good job explaining this, but okay, so let, let's take a step out, but if you compare one system with another, you do find that one system may be doing somewhat of the other system is doing, maybe not to the degree of one compared to the other, but there's like some something happening whereby, you know, 
whatever it may be, like the, both of them are doing it to varying degrees, one a lot more than the other. So I don't know what this means, but I think that's it. I don't want to end on this note, but you know, may see in our minds prevail. And uh, uh, I would love to live in a world where <laughs> People are collaborating to on on various uh, 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 to solve various problems, uh, solve uh, hunger in a quality sense, which we are invested in. And cellular agriculture is a great example. I was just talking to somebody. Uh, thank you very much. Very gracious for your time. If you happen to watch this video. It's very detailed. A lot of like abstract angles to this uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, but uh, yeah, I had a good chat with somebody at the uh, it's New Harvest actually. And so yeah, it'd be pretty great to have collaboration on the cellular agriculture side of things. I don't know how the conversation is specific to intellectual property, how that angle is going to be. Explored, but uh, I'm pretty green when it comes to that. Uh, so, hoping to be educated on that. Uh, but yeah, there's going to be way to collaborate on a couple of key areas. But the most important aspect uh, and part of that is to have the norms and the behaviors, uh, some structure for enabling that so that. Uh, Everyone who is acting in a participatory sense knows what to not do. And that's very important um, because in the absence of that reality, uh, again, like I try to draw the spectrum, something bad could happen. Uh, at the very least, something bad could happen to that actor and the actors connected to that actor, which would make, which could, and this is not a threat, but that would make life difficult for those actors. Uh, I use the word actor in the sense that you can actor agent somebody uh, in that sense. So this is my talk on basic research now, after six years, in between these six years, not to sound all that, I explored this, like I said, I've mentioned this a couple of times. From a variety of different angles, I am coming at this. I'm coming to this. I'm, I'm, I'm arriving at this topic again um, from a perspective whereby I feel <laughs> my ego is a little bit uh, sublimated or pounded, <laughs> however you want to look at it, or tamed, and uh, that's it. Thanks for watching in support of basic research and I'm down to have a conversation or discussion uh, specific to basic research anytime to learn more about it, to learn how science is funded, to learn more about the inputs that are needed to support the scientific research base now from the historical precedent of the past. I've looked in a little bit into the lives of, uh, actually, I've barely looked into it, like you know, just a couple of videos on YouTube, like individuals like Frederick Turman or like the modern uh, or the pioneers of uh, the modern, well, the Silicon Valley. Uh, so there's always a couple of key ingredients to make something beautiful. And uh, Leveraging the scientific research is a core uh, aspect of it, which I feel will probably continue indefinitely. Because uh, maybe there is some other way uh, in, the, in the wider, grander scheme of things. And uh, maybe there is a civilization out there that they just kind of snap their fingers and they merge. They've already merged quantum mechanics with relativity or however everything works, or the, maybe the basis of information. Uh, the universe is information, so they could just mold the information however they want. But I would still think for those 
things to work, even as hypothetical as that may be, you would still need a cer certain set of mechanisms whereby you want the mechanisms to do what you want it to do. And so this is where science, mathematics, science, engineering would come in. In these six cases, they would just be rolled up to something else, so like some other layer of abstraction. And from a stoicism perspective, which I'm very new to, you have logic, you have physics, and you have logic, logic physics, ethics. So from a, I would have thinking reason. So logic, physics, ethics, reason, right? I would think there should be four things to the stoicism aspect. So you have those four, and then from that emerges this model, math, science, engineering. But it should have that overall you got to have an ethical framework for all, all the, and how, that's a different question. Anyways, I got to go. Thanks a lot for watching. If there's, if you, if you saw this, like, I don't know who, who's going to watch this, but please invite me to conversations on, on, on related topics. I want to know more about this topic, as you can tell. And yeah, that's it. Have a good one. Thank you.